This episode of The Minimalists is 100% advertisement free. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit theminimalists.com slash donate. Enjoy the show. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. I'm Joshua Fields Milburn. And I am Ryan Nicodemus, with a little bit of a cold today, but... We're still the minimalists. We are still the minimalists. I hope you feel better soon, Ryan, but thank you for showing up for this. Welcome to episode number 11. We're calling this one sentimental because we're dealing with a bunch of questions about sentimental items. So we have some voicemail questions, some social media questions. Before, before we get to that, let's, uh, let's talk about a few things that Ryan and I have going on. We are hitting the road in May. This May, 2016, for our Minimalism Documentary Tour 2016 where we're going to answer the question, how might your life be better with less? So we're going to be showing our documentary in these 14 different cities, uh, New York, Boston, Washington, D.C., Miami, Dallas, Dayton, Chicago, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, Missoula, and Toronto, Canada. Toronto, I should say. Toronto, Canada. Um, and, and so we're going to a bunch of different cities, and a few of those events have actually quite a few of them have already sold out. And so, so don't worry. So we sold out in New York, we sold out in DC, and Boston, and Dayton, and Chicago, and Seattle, and San Francisco, and LA, and Salt Lake City. But we added second screenings or got bigger theaters for most of those. So if you you were on there before and you said, "Oh, I really wanted to go to the Los Angeles event, but it sold out." Well, don't, don't worry. We have a bigger theater there. Or in some cases, like uh, San Francisco, we have uh, two screens now set up. So those will sell out as well. So you might want to get your tickets sooner rather than later. If we're not coming to your city, don't worry, because the documentary is still coming to your city. You can just go to minimalismfilm.com, click on See the Film, and then you'll find there are several hundred screenings already scheduled. Now, here's where we need, we need your help, because many of those screens won't actually happen in unless we have enough ticket reservations. This isn't one of those cases where you're like, oh, I'm going to wait to the day of the event, and then I'll just buy tickets that day. Uh, no, you won't, because then the screening won't be happening. We have to have enough ticket reservations. So we have three or 4,000 people who have already uh, gotten their tickets so far, but we need your help. So if you have a screening and you live in Wichita, and all of a sudden you say, I'm going to wait till the last day, it will be too late if we haven't tipped the screening already, meaning we need to sell enough tickets beforehand for the theater to actually show the film. So just go to minimalismfilm.com and click on See the Film. You can find your local screening. Grab your tickets. That way we can make sure the, the documentary actually plays in your city. You can also see the trailer for the film there at minimalismfilm.com. Let's listen to our first voicemail question. This one is from Sintley in Montreal, Canada. Five years ago, I moved to Canada for an indefinite amount of time. And before I left, I got rid of 80% of my things. I'm talking about my car, my record collection, my clothes. And I just kept two bins of clothes that were the cream of the crop. I mean, um, I had been an avid vintage shopper and all these things are really special to me and unique and like little treasures. And the plan was every time I came to visit from Montreal, I'd bring in a piece and gradually just fill it up and take all the stuff with me. Um, well, my mom threw it all away, just threw it out. And I was devastated and it took years to forgive her. It's been five years. And sometimes I still feel myself longing for those items, um, like my identity was caught up in them, and I, I just feel still like a really strong attachment to it. I just was wondering if you have any advice for people who involuntarily got their possessions t uh, taken away or thrown out, maybe a fire, maybe someone, um, and how hard it is to let go of the things that didn't have value to you, that were special, that you felt were um, – things that you adored instead of like choosing to give them up. Um, and I still have a really hard time to this day with my wardrobe. 
because I feel like it doesn't represent me, those clothes did. Certainly, I'm, I'm sorry that you're dealing with some sort of emotional stress and anxiety through that whole process. I will tell you, I'm glad that you did forgive your mother. It's important that we don't put things over top of our relationships, which I did for a very long time. I forsook the important things for the material things. And I think you've realized that. And what you've probably realized, I hope, hope, I hope that you've realized this, is that forgiving is freeing. And by letting go, that's really giving, letting go is giving a gift to yourself and being willing to let go of even the things you thought were your favorite things. I know in a podcast episode prior, I talked about the experiment I did with a journalist who said, what are your, what are your favorite things? And I listed, well, here's my favorite shirt and, and here's my favorite pair of jeans. Here are my favorite pair of shoes. And I got to thinking, well, why are these my favorite things? And you know what I realized was they were my favorite things because I said they were my favorite things. Now, true, that shirt was very comfortable, but it certainly wasn't the only comfortable shirt in the world. That shirt looked really good on me, but it's not the only shirt that could ever look good on me. The truth was they were meaningful to me only because I gave them meaning. And the problem with it is I was giving too much meaning to those things, and, and then it made me forsake the people around me. And so uh, I'm reminded, I read a study recently from the uh, Journal of Consumer Psychology, and, and I'll just read a, a quick paragraph from that. The objects you struggle to get rid of are likely tied to your self-worth, according to the 2011 study. Rather than viewing those objects as, quote, mine, you may think of them as, quote, me. The study found that people struggle the most to part with possessions that lack monetary or functional value. That's why people who lose their possessions to burglaries or fires report the psychological damage is far worse than the financial loss. Yeah, so Josh, let me ask you, when you got rid of your favorite pants and shirt and shoes, what happened? Man, I, my other clothes just stepped up to perform their task. I, I had a, a new favorite shirt that was comfortable and looked good on me. I had a new f- a favorite pair of jeans, a new favorite pair of shoes. And, and with that experiment, I realized that I could have favorite things without tying too much meaning to those things. So for anyone who's listening, I would encourage you to take a look at some of your favorite things and, and just try to let go of one. Now, don't get rid of all of your favorite things. Don't get rid of all of your sentimental items. In fact, our sentimental items are often the hardest things to part with. When, when people approach us and they're saying, I'm trying to embrace this minimalism thing. I'm, start, I'm starting this minimalist journey, and I'm going to start with all my sentimental items. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. That, that is not where you want to start because you want to get momentum. And, and it's really hard to start with the sentimental stuff because it's hard to let go of any of that. So, so once you've reached a point where you've gotten momentum, then you can start to tackle some of these, these sentimental items. And, and with Scently, I, I found that by, by not associating them, as this uh, Journal of Consumer Psychology pointed out, not associating those things as me, which is what you were doing. You're saying those were, were me, basically. We derive our self-worth from those things. I was able to say, no, those are mine for a particular season. And in the, long, in the long run, everything is impermanent. So you're not going to have those things forever because even when you die, they're, they're going to go by the wayside. Yeah, and she, she asked about, you know, what happens with people who have a fire in their home or uh, maybe they get uh, robbed, they have a robbery happen. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, uh, certainly, we've had many, many people come up to us at our events and say, oh, I just had a fire or my friend just had a fire or we, we, we've, we've got robbed and, and they took all of our stuff. And I, I never realized how much I wouldn't miss that stuff. And usually what Josh and I will say is, is you know, congratulations. We'll, we'll put a spin on it and say, congratulations, you have the opportunity to start fresh. Now, this is a little bit different of a situation because, you know, her mom threw him out without her permission. It would be like, you know, if, if I was living with my parents and they, when I was, uh, you know, away one day, they just went into my room and threw everything out. Like that would feel very disrespectful. I think that would hurt me worse than a fire or even someone uh, robbing me 
because it's like, wow, I know you. Why didn't you ask me? And so maybe there was a little bit of a miscommunication there. But I would say certainly this is an opportunity for you to start over. I I was thinking about Josh and I's initial drive uh, through Montana when, when we first um, ever drove th- through the state. We were coming back from Vancouver, BC. And I just remember when we first pulled into Montana, I was like, oh my God, this is the most beautiful, beautiful scenery I, I have ever, I've ever seen. And then we drive 10, 20, 50 miles. And then it was a completely new landscape that was just as beautiful, maybe a little bit more beautiful, maybe a little bit less beautiful. But I mean, really, I couldn't tell you. It made me feel the same way. And and that's how I kind of look at these clothes. It's yes, you may have had uh, the cream of the crop. You may have had all these wonderful clothes that look great on you, but that doesn't mean uh, that you can't go out and find things that are going to look just as beautiful or maybe even more beautiful. Yeah. So, so congratulations. You had the cream of the crop. There are plenty more crops out there for you to to you know, gather that cream and have new favorite things in your life. And as you move forward, as you grow, you'll find that the things that you let go of aren't as good as the things you're running toward in the future. Yeah. And I, I think I would just add one piece of advice to any uh, listener is that if you have something that you absolutely love, so in Sentley's case, she had these two bins of clothes that were the cream of the co- crop that she absolutely loved. If you're going to ask uh, a family member to hold on to them for five years, or let's say you're going to put them in a in a storage unit, God forbid, but let's say you're going to do something like that, make sure that you're very deliberate with storing those. So uh, if you're going to storm with a friend or a family member, be very clear. These are my favorite clothes. Let me know if you're going to get rid of them. If you're going to put them in a storage unit, make sure you're going to put them somewhere uh, that they're not going to be damaged. Um, so think a little bit ahead if, if you're going to uh, store some of your favorite items somewhere. Please don't get a storage unit, though, please. Amen. Deva in Denver has a question for us. What do you do with heirloom jewelry? Stuff that was my grandmother's, both my grandmother's, my mom held on to for me. And now I have it, and it doesn't take up a lot of space, and I really don't mind storing it. I just know I'll never wear it. And now my six-year-old daughter looks at it, and she gets excited, and she wants me to hang on to it for her. I really just don't want to um, burden her with passing things on that she might like now, but she may not like later. The thing I do with my grandmother's jewelry is I wear it all the time. <laughs> I mean, these four earrings I'm wearing right now. They look gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you. I, well, they just have so much sentimental value to me. No, I, I, I totally respect where you're coming from because, Debbie, you're actually at a, at a great place right now. You have the opportunity to let go because you don't really have this emotional attachment to the stuff. What you have the attachment to is the meaning you think other people may give to it in some hypothetical future, and, and in particular, your six-year-old daughter. And what I would encourage you to do is let your six-year-old daughter – Play with it. Let, let her have, have the opportunity to use it now. Now, she may lose some of it. She may get some value from it now. But like you said, you don't want to burden her in the future. Have an open conversation with her and make sure that it's not burden, burdening her as, as she gets older. And if, she, if it does, then encourage her and help her let go. Help her find someone else to, to give value from it. Also, when, when passing it on, I would encourage you to have fewer sentimental items to pass on. So it's not about having no sentimental items or, or filling your life with, with, with zero uh, sent, sentiment. You, what you want to do is have fewer, so the, the fewer sentimental items that you do have add much more value to your life and to the other people around you, instead of watering down your sentimental possessions by having dozens or hundreds or thousands of sentimental items. Yeah, I, I would echo the give give a one of the items to your daughter. I mean, this could be a really good learning experience for her, whether she hangs on to that one item and she really values that and, and has that growing up, or maybe she does lose it. I know when I was like four or five years old, my mom gave me a watch. It was like this little, you know, cheap Casio digital watch, but it meant so much to me. And I remember losing it. And uh, I was thinking to myself, man, that was my first watch. I can't believe I lost it. I was really hoping to uh, hold on to that. 
it was a huge learning lesson for me. Um, when I got things in the future, I took better care of it. Um, I learned a lot from it. So, I mean, your daughter's six years old. What a great time to start helping her uh, think a little bit differently when she approaches things like sentimental items. Our next question is from Melissa in Pennsylvania. I've inherited a lot of things from family, and I just feel a need to get rid of some things, but I'm really attached to the stuff, the, the stuff, of course. So I'm just trying to figure out how to let go of some of these things, like uh, lots of little tchotchkes and dishes and all kinds of stuff, how to let go of it. And also, um, I, I think that these things are worth something, obviously, and I want to sell them on eBay or Craigslist or something like that if I decide to get rid of them. And my husband says, no, that takes more energy and time, so maybe you shouldn't do that. Um, so anyway, this is a hard one for me. I'm able to clear out a lot of things that just don't really appeal to me anymore, but the things that have sentiments attached to them are really hard for me. Well, um, tchotchke by definition is, is kind of a pejorative. Um, I understand that we have, you know, T-shirts or a little beer koozie or something that may have a little bit of meaning uh, because we got uh, we we got it at a at a time that we want to remember. But at the end of the day, uh, as we always say, the memory are not in our things. And what I would encourage you to do is maybe pick a tchotchke, Melissa, that you feel like you might be able to part with and just put it in the trash. See how you feel the next morning. That, that's what I did. I started really, really small. I, I never had a, a whole lot of sentimental items. Um, I had a shoebox full of like letters and some high school memorabilia after my packing party uh, that I ran into that was really, really hard to let go. But that's, that's kind of how I started. I just, I picked a letter and I thought to myself, all right, I'm going to at least let one of these letters go uh, I'm going to do my best at at this minimalism thing. And I took a picture of it so I could still read it if I really wanted to. Um, I threw it in the trash. And the next morning, uh, I didn't even think about it. I didn't, in fact, I didn't even think about it until um, I got home from work uh, that day, that next day. And that really taught me a, a, a valuable lesson. So that day, I actually went and grabbed that shoebox and took some pictures of some of the other letters uh, that I wanted to hold on to and threw everything out. I'll tell you what's what's crazy though, out of you know probably 10, 15 letters, I might have taken a picture of like two or three of them because at the time when those letters were written to me from family members or friends or whatever, uh, they were very meaningful, but they weren't meaningful once I read them again. And uh, yeah, I mean, really, I'm just boiling it down to this, Melissa. Start small, pick something that you feel like you can start to get rid of and, and really under uh, get a feel for and understand how when you let go of these tchotchkes, when you let go of a little bit of China, uh, that it's not really that big of a deal and it's not going to hurt as bad as you think it will. Certainly take a picture of that stuff. Uh, pictures can spark memories. Um, but the physical item itself, again, the memories are not in those items. Yeah, and I would also give yourself a deadline. You said that you think some of these things are worth money. You, you know what? They may or may not be worth money. And your husband's like, no, just hurry up and get rid of it. Great. You have someone who's there encouraging you. So set, set a deadline. If I can't sell it in two weeks, then I promise that I will donate it. And, and stick to that deadline no matter what. And try to sell the things that you know you can get money from. You can do some quick research on, on eBay or Craigslist or wherever. And put in the work. Put in the effort to be willing to let go. And, and then when it comes time to letting go, especially of the sentimental items, be willing to let go. Uh, back in 2008, my mom moved from Ohio down to Florida to, to finally retire. And a few months after she did, she found out she had lung cancer. And then later on that next year in 2009... She was gone, and I spent a lot of time with her down in Florida. She struggled through her, her chemo and her radiation treatments, but when she passed, I, I realized I needed to make one last visit down to Florida, and this time it was to deal with her stuff. So I flew from Dayton, Ohio, down to St. Pete Beach, Florida, and when I got to her home, I discovered about three apartments worth of stuff crammed into her tiny one-bedroom apartment. And I'm not saying that mom was a hoarder, 
There were no dead cats in her freezer. But she owned a lot of stuff. She had 65 years worth of accumulations. And I'm not sure if you know this, but the average American household has more than 300,000 items in it. 300,000 items. But of course, most of us aren't hoarders, right? We just hold on to a lot of stuff. We hold on to a lifetime of memories. And I know that's what mom certainly did. A lot of tchotchkes in there and, and a lot of other things that she gave a lot of meaning to and that by, by proxy, I was giving a lot of meaning to. And I had really no idea what to do. And so I did what any good son would do. I called U-Haul. I called and, and I asked for the largest truck they had. In fact, I needed one so large I had to wait for I waited an extra day for the 26-foot truck to arrive. And as I waited for it to arrive, I invited some of mom's friends over to help me uh, go through, sort through some of her belongings. There was just too much stuff to go at it alone. If I looked at her living room, it was stuffed with big antique furniture and old paintings and more doilies than I could count. And then I walked over to her kitchen. Her kitchen was stuffed with hundreds of uh, plates and cups and bowls and ill-assorted utensils. Her bathroom was stuffed with, well, with enough hygiene products to, to start a small beauty supply business. And, uh, man, I, I walked over to her. She had this little linen closet, and it looked like someone was running a hotel out of that linen closet, which was stuffed with... Uh, just stacks of mismatched bath towels and dish towels and beach towels and bed sheets and blankets and quilts. And then I walked over to her bedroom. And don't even get me started on her bedroom. Uh, uh, why did mom have 14 winter coats stuffed into her bedroom closet? 14. Now, keep in mind, she lived in St. Pete Beach, Florida. Suffice it to say, mom owned a lot of stuff. I had no idea what to do with any of it. So again, I did what any good son would do. I rented a storage locker back in Ohio so I could store all of mom's stuff. And uh, when I called the storage facility, I, I asked them for the largest storage locker they had. Do you know what they asked me? Do you want one that's climate controlled? I said, climate control? Why would I want one that's climate controlled? Is that so mom's stuff can be comfortable? No, I just want a big box with a padlock on it. You see, I couldn't co-mingle mom's stuff with my stuff. I already had a, a large house and a full basement full of stuff. But a storage locker? Oh, yeah. A storage locker would let me hold on to everything, just in case I needed it someday in some non-existent hypothetical future. You know, just in case. Just in case are the three most dangerous words in the English language. And so I was just sitting there or standing there or boxing stuff up, att attempting to finish packing mom's stuff. When, when I looked under her bed and I found these four boxes and they were labeled one, two, three, four. These old printer paper boxes, kind of heavy, sealed with a lot of packing tape. And uh, so I pulled them out one by one and, and I just sort of pondered for a minute. I wonder what could be possibly be in those boxes. And then I realized it was my, as I opened the boxes and went through it, it was my old elementary school paperwork, grades one through four. And as I opened the boxes, my curiosity ran wild. And I, I, I thought to myself, why, why was mom holding on to all this paperwork, all this stupid paperwork? But then all these memories came rushing back, right? And then it was obvious. Uh, mom was attempting to hold on to a piece of me by holding on to all the stuff. She was holding on to all the memories that were inside those boxes. But wait a minute. Mom hadn't accessed those boxes in over two decades. They had been sitting there under her bed, sealed, moving from one apartment to the next. She hadn't been accessing the memories in those boxes, which made me realize something important for the first time. Our memories are not in our things. Our memories are inside us. You see, Mom didn't need to hold on to those boxes to hold on to a piece of me. I was never inside those boxes. But then I looked around at her apartment. I looked around at all her stuff, and I realized I was getting ready to do the same thing, except instead of putting her memories in a box under my bed, I was going to cram it all into a big box with a padlock, just in case. So I did what any good son would do. I called U-Haul. I canceled the truck. And I called and I canceled the storage locker and I, I spent the next 12 days selling or donating almost everything. And I learned a bunch of really important lessons along the way. 
Uh, first, not only did I learn that, that our memories are not in our things, but, but I also learned about value, real value. You see, if I'm honest with myself, I was just going to selfishly cling to mom's stuff. But, but, but of course, I wasn't going to get any real value from those things as they sat there locked away in perpetuity. But the truth is that by letting go, I could add value to other people's lives. Just because I wasn't going to get value from mom's stuff, that doesn't mean that someone else wouldn't. So I, I donated much of it to her friends. Uh, a lot of them were in the same building as her, uh, and to local charities. And I, I gave the stuff a new home. And the things that I was able to sell, I was able to take that money and donate it to the, t- to the two charities that helped mom with uh, her chemo and, and her radiation down there in, in St. Petersburg. And I realized that I could contribute beyond myself if I was willing to let go. And when I finally returned to Ohio, I returned with just a handful of sentimental items, uh, an old painting, a, a few boxes of photographs, and maybe even a couple doilies, which led me to another important lesson, this one about sentimental items in particular, I discovered that by having fewer sentimental items, we're able to enjoy the ones we have much more. I get far more value from the few sentimental items I kept than by watering them down with unlimited numbers of of tchotchkes. And the next lesson I learned was a pretty practical one. While it's true that our memories are not in our things, it's also true that sometimes our things can trigger memories. So before I left uh, left Florida, I I took a bunch of photos of many of mom's possessions before I I donated them. And when I went back to Ohio, I went back with just a, a few boxes of photographs, which I was able to scan and store digitally. And those photographs made it easier for me to let go because I realized I wasn't letting go of any of my memories. And I think the last lesson I learned was perhaps the most compelling, I learned that the true cost of of consumption is much higher than the initial price tag. You see, by by consuming all this stuff repeatedly, things that we're not using, we actually produce more waste. And so being responsible with the things we let go and donating them, finding them new homes, it's the most responsible, least wasteful way of of taking things into our lives and and letting go of the things that, that no longer add value. Our next question is from Sarah in Austin, Texas. My mom is, I guess what you would call a class A hoarder, and she keeps everything. For example, I think she has every possible comforter from our childhood and outfit that we wore and pictures, and she just doesn't know how to let go, which I think is even harder now that her and my father passed, or, uh, separated um, within the last couple of years. And so she moved from a four bedroom house to a one bedroom apartment. And I guess my question is, how do I help her kind of get rid of all this stuff without being judgmental and without being un, you know, unsupportive of her and the anxiety that comes with getting rid of the stuff? Sarah, first thing I would do is ask your mother if she wants help, because if she doesn't want help, then it's not help. It's not helpful at all. And so if she does want help, and I would approach that in a way that, that's very kind and supportive, not telling her that she needs to change, but if she wants to make some changes, especially as she's gone through a move, that you're willing to, to help. And, and I also would encourage you to understand that we are all fighting our own battles here. And so what she's going through at her age is going to be considerably different from what you're going through. Her willingness to let go is going to be different. Her ability to let go is going to be different. And so uh, there's an essay that I would encourage you to read. It's on our website. It's about understanding other people. In fact, it's called Understanding Others at theminimalists.com slash understanding. And we sort of walk you through the process there of what it takes to understand what the person is going through. And and the acronym we use is TARA, T-A-R-A. The first place we want to go is the T. We want to be able to tolerate someone and their behavior. Someone we care about, the first step toward understanding is, is tolerance. But of course, tolerance is a weak virtue, but it is a good start. So at first, her, her behavior might seem bothersome to you, and, and I would say that it's best for you to avoid a, a sort of knee-jerk reaction of, of fight or flight, like, oh my God, you should live your life this way. 
Well, no, her, her life is going to be different. And if she wants help, the first thing you can do is tolerate the situation that she's in right now to help her get to to the the next place where, where you need to go and where she needs to go. After you've tolerated uh, her her behavior, her belongings, her process, that's a great first step. Congratulations. But then you want to be able to accept where she is. So that's the, the second letter in, in the TERRA acronym. So acceptance is, is crucial. I think to uh, truly live in concert with others, we must quickly move past tolerance toward this feeling of, of true acceptance. And, and so once you've done that, you realize that your mother's uh, collection has a purpose to her, or many of her things will still have a purpose to you, even though it doesn't serve a purpose or bring you joy individually. And while you may not like the particular thing that she likes, that's okay. It's, it's her stuff. And you, you're there. You want to help. So after you move on past uh, acceptance, you want to move toward respect. And this is, this is a big leap. This is the R in Tara. You're going from accepting where she's at to respecting her, her, her things, her, her, her love of, of the things that she has. And, and it's not just tolerating. It's not just... Uh, accepting, it's truly respecting her idiosyncrasies. And, and I'll tell you, it's much more challenging to, to respect where someone is than to just tolerate them. But once we're able to respect them, we're able to, to start to figure out how, how they tick and sort of get inside their mind and realize why, you know, okay, maybe you never hoard figurines or, or, or guitars or, or whatever, but there are many beliefs that you also hold that other people uh, may not necessarily understand or may not be in line with their, their own beliefs. And, and so if you extend the same respect that you expect others to extend to you, you'll finally be you know, one step closer to that understanding. And the final letter in that Terra acronym is appreciate. So we've moved from tolerance to acceptance to respect to appreciating the other person. Now this is this is difficult. You know, with respect in, in your that's sitting in your rearview mirror, I think that understanding's right around the corner, but but only once we're able to appreciate. So um, let's say your mother experiences great joy from from her collection or some of the things she has that she doesn't want to let go of. Well, why would you want to change that? And so if she doesn't necessarily want help, then it's not about forcing help on her unless it is inflect, inflicting pain on her or, or the people around her. And so ultimately you want her to be happy, right? And so if her some of her things bring contentment to her life, then and, you, and if you truly care about her, which obviously it sounds like you, you care a lot about her, then her things should sort of bring you joy by, by proxy. And, and because I feel that, that happiness is, is contagious. So if some of these things in her life make her happy, it's going to rub off on you as well. Yeah, <clears throat> that makes me think about Mariah and I and how, I mean, if I wasn't, if I was single living by myself, I would probably have, you know, 80, 90% less stuff that is in my apartment right now. Because Mariah has, you know, some books that she holds on to and, and some, uh, some DVDs, uh, or, you know, our closet. Um, it's pretty much Mariah's closet. <laughs> She's got a lot of shoes. But at the end of the day, none of that bothers me because I, I do accept her and I do appreciate and, and, and respect her. And I think really uh, once people get that, that Terra acronym down, it really helps you support the other person. And I, you know, I've never went to Mariah and asked her, Hey, we, <clears throat> well, I, I take that back. I have definitely asked her to get rid of, uh, you know, some items. I've never told her that she had to get rid of items. You need to get rid of this or, you know, this is going to affect our relationship. I've never done that. I have went to her and said, Oh, you know, this is an item that we uh, don't use a lot. Is it okay if I uh, donate this or or give it away to someone. And sometimes she says yes, and sometimes she says no. I I want to hold on to that, and that's okay. Uh, but we 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 work through that. But what I'll tell you is having that approach, Mariah gets rid of 
<laughs> she gets rid of stuff all the time. And she just came to me yesterday and she's like, oh man, I need to, I need to go through some of my stuff and get, and get rid of some of my items. Um, do I feel that way? Sure. But like, I don't bring that up to her all the time. That's something that she comes up with, uh, on her own. And it's really about, you know, helping, uh, helping your, your grandmother, uh, see the benefits. Um, if, if you really want to help her move forward, Try to find some benefits that she is going to experience from letting go of that hoard, whether it's, man, you know, if we get rid of some of this stuff, this is really going to take a lot of pressure off of uh, kids and grandkids um, to, to, to not hold on to stuff. Or, man, Grandma, you know, I know that you wanted to start that college fund for little Jimmy. Uh, if you sell that grand piano in your dining room, you might be able to, to start a n- nice little college fund for Jimmy. I'm just throwing stuff out there. But, but try to find the benefits uh, that, that she can kind of look forward to. But, but ultimately, I will go back to what Josh uh, opened up uh, this, this, this answer with. Does she want the help? And, and that's really where you got to start. And if she does, then, then help her find the benefits. Yeah, and if she doesn't want the help and you still want to set a good example for her, eventually she may come around and, and ask for that help uh, in time. I know Ryan and I have found that with a lot of people is we don't go telling people you should go clean out your closet or whatever. We set a good example, and then often people come to us for help uh, after they realize that, that, they, that they feel like they need it. Uh, people will ask you for help when they are ready, not when you are ready. Our next question is from Treasure in Houston. How do you prevent yourself from having deep sentimental connections with your items, especially the new items you purchase? This is a problem I have, and I'm trying to let go, but I do have those few new items that I buy, and I, I'm so connected to them already. And if I don't cut this out, I'll be back at where I was before, and I don't want that. The first thing I do, Treasure, is try to bring fewer things into your life that you can give attachment to. So by by clearing the clutter before it is clutter, that, that's the best way to do it. We want to kill Godzilla when he is a egg or a baby. Don't wait till Godzilla is taking over the town. But once you do have a new item, how do you how do you prevent yourself from attaching too much meaning to it? Well, I, I talked about the the journal article from uh, earlier, but I, I would encourage you to realize that the thing is not you. It is a separate thing that is there to augment your reality, so to speak, to augment your experience with reality. These are just tools that you've brought into your life. And so ask yourself a few questions. You know, how can I bring fewer things into my life? And then once you do, why are you bringing them into your life? What is your outcome? It is your job at this point to determine what is your outcome? What purpose is that new possession going to serve? And that is why you have the thing. If it's going to bring you joy, if it's going going to to serve a purpose in your life, that's why you've, you've brought the thing in. It's not, and it has no more meaning other than that, that it's a tool for you to use to improve your life and your circumstance. Yeah, I, I would encourage you, I would just echo that. Do not bring in as much stuff in your life. I mean, thinking about this, I'm trying to think of an, an analogy um, that we can kind of move away from stuff. And the only thing I could think of is like uh, someone who drinks a lot, like a really hardcore alcoholic who has worked their whole life, maybe not to stop drinking, but maybe to... Uh, just be moderate with their drinking. So let's say they've spent a year or two years or however much time they spent and they finally got to this point where they were uh, able to consume, you know, a couple drinks a week, whatever it may be. And then they have an opportunity to go to uh, like a party or something. And they know that they've worked the past two years to really uh, control their drinking. And they know that if they go to a party, this is going to be a trigger for them. So in that case, I would suggest to that person, like, don't go and trigger yourself to fall back into what you've worked so hard to get out of. So I, I don't know if that I don't know if that comparison makes sense or not to all you listeners out there. But I would just say, I mean, it sounds like you had a uh, to, to treasure. I would say it sounds like you had a hoarding problem, or maybe a, a, a hanging on to possessions, collecting, uh, putting sentimental. Um, attachment to these items, but it sounds like you were able to get over it because you said, you know, I'm, I'm buying new items. I don't want to get back to that spot where I was at. So, so do everything you can possible to, to not get back 
to that spot. Um, this also this reminds me of an essay we wrote about um, the things uh, that uh, we're prepared to walk away from. Theminimalists.com slash walk. And that essay does a really good job of just showing how Josh and I have really been able to pretty much prepare to walk away from anything, not just our sentimental items, but even relationships. I mean, at the end of the day, I love Josh and I expect us to be best friends for the rest of our lives. But if Josh started, oh, I don't know. Um, let's say I became a serial killer. Yeah, let's say he became a serial killer or he started embezzling or he started, um, you know, he started uh, uh, making prophecies. I mean, <laughs> whatever, whatever it is, things that didn't align with my values and beliefs, I would have to distance myself um, from Josh because ultimately uh, this is my life and um, I – I'm going to make the best decisions possible for me and the people around me. So I would encourage you to read that essay, Treasure. Um, that, that would certainly help you at least kind of understand where Josh and I come from. Uh, I, I just want to say to all these voicemail questions, um, this, is not, this is not a perfect life. Josh and I are not talking about, hey, th- this is how you live a perfect life. And, and we're not even talking about how to live an easy life. What Josh and I talk about is is living a simple life. So, you know, our answers here, it doesn't doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, listen to this podcast and and have this magic bullet answer and everything's going to be easy all of a sudden. It takes a lot of work to get there. It takes a lot of dedication. Um, You could look at it uh, as mindfulness. I mean, it's something every single day that you have to focus on, that you have to work on, especially in a situation with Treasure where she, uh, it's so easy for her to become sentimentally attached. I would say for for Treasure, uh, this is something that every day she's going to have to focus on. Um, I would, I'd, I'd recommend meditating a little bit, help yourself be a little bit, a little bit more mindful that way. That could certainly help. Now, Treasure, I know it's weird that I'm like recommending meditation to help you not attach sentiment with uh, new items that you bring in to your home. But, you know, I I would liken this with an impulse and I'm a very impulsive person and meditation is something that has really, really helped me to get control of my impulses. All right, y'all, we'd love to hear what y'all have to say. So if you have a comment about sentimental items, including minimalism tips for how you handle letting go of sentimental items or bringing fewer sentimental items into your life, or maybe how you enjoy the fewer sentimental items you do have, then leave us a voicemail at 406-219-7839. We'll air our favorite comments and tips on the next episode or on upcoming episodes. And if your voicemail is selected, we'll send you an autographed copy of one of our books, either Essential or Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life, or, of course, my personal favorite, Everything That Remains. All right, let's move on to our iTunes comments of the week. This one is titled Balanced, and it was submitted by Raquel. Raquel writes, I love that Josh and Ryan know how to balance radical straight talk with a gentle, loving understanding for the struggles of the modern human condition. Listening to this is one of the best hours of my week. Wow, Raquel, thank you so much for that great comment. We are so happy that we could be one of the best hours of your week. Yeah, we're going to send you a copy of Everything That Remains. Hope you find some value in that. And thank you to everyone else who has left us a a review on iTunes. Your positive, honest reviews help our simple living message reach many, many, many more ears. So please keep them coming, and we'll keep reading some of our favorite iTunes comments on the podcast. So feel free to get creative with all of your iTunes comments. We're we're looking forward to sharing some funny uh, comments in, in the coming weeks. All right, now it is time for our hashtag Ask the Minimalists lightning round. We're on Twitter and Instagram at The Minimalists and Facebook.com slash The Minimalists. All right, our first question from the social media world for hashtag Ask the Minimalists lightning round comes from Haley. Haley writes, how do I help my parents get rid of sentimental items and not just by giving them to me? I've already come clean and told them I don't want my grandmother's china, my grandfather's coin collection, etc. But in telling them this, I believe it has made them feel as if the burden of these things is on them. They're reluctant to let them go because they feel guilty. 
Haley, your job here is to give encouragement to uh, your parents because ultimately it's not about forcing them to get rid of the stuff. You can set the expectation that you don't want the stuff, but you can give encouragement to help them let go. And at the same time, ask them for encouragement. Let them know that you don't want to, to acquire these, these things, or maybe you want, to, uh, you want to acquire only a few of the things that, that will help you out. Now, I'll point this out. This is going to happen more and more and more as, as the years progress. Uh, U.S. News reports that by 2030, the, the population of people over 65 will increase by 80 percent. That's the, the whole baby boomer generation, right? Uh, my, both of my parents were actually part of the, the, the silent generation. We kind of skipped the baby boomer generation. They had me late in life. And, and so uh, this whole baby boomer generation that is coming of age and uh, many of them uh, are turning 70 this year, you know, they're, they're looking to let go, and this is going to happen more and more and more. As you see over the next 15 years, uh, this population is exploding. It's, one might say, booming. And, and so as these baby boomers age, there's going to be more uh, of this uh, wanting to hand off sentimental items to, uh, to more people. And the best thing that you can do is encourage them to let go now and let them know that if they're holding on to these things for the rest of their lives, it's something that you're going to have to deal with once they pass. And generally, parents don't want to burden their children with hundreds of thousands of items that they're one day going to have to deal with. Yeah, and there's a part of her comment where she talks about how you know she feels as if the burden of these things is on them now. And I would say it is on them right now uh, because they're making it a burden on themselves. I mean, if Josh came to me <clears throat> and said, hey, man, I've got this like record collection. That's really, it's a really awesome vinyl collection and I want you to have it. I'm going to look at him and say, I'm sorry, man. I, I have no need for that vinyl collection. Now, Josh might feel, oh, man, I really thought Ryan would like this, but he doesn't. Um and now I've got to hold on to this record collection. I, I would say that that record collection is still a burden on him. But what I could do is is help him to move past uh, this burden that he's carrying. Um, why are your parents feeling guilty? Start with that question. Why do they feel guilty on letting this stuff go? If it's because they're not going to be able to pass it down to you, well, there's a pretty easy solution there, right? You explain to them how you don't want this stuff passed down to you. Let's say that uh, you've got other siblings and family members who they want to pass these items to, well, then get with those other siblings and family members and see what items they want to hold on to. And, and maybe they can take those off of your parents' hands. And then everything else that's left over, you can kind of help them maybe do a packing party or, or sell some stuff on, on Craigslist or, or, or eBay. I know one of our voicemail uh, questions, they were asking about selling stuff. I mean, that's certainly a good option. Um, you don't want to nickel and dime yourself to death. It gets really stressful when you're trying to sell stuff for 10, 20 bucks and you've got a thousand items you're trying to sell for, you know, a dollar here, five dollars there, three dollars, three dollars there. I mean, have a garage sale. Um, you could do something like that to let to let those things go really quickly. But ultimately, um, yes, I would agree with you. The burden is on them now. And I would look at it as a an opportunity for you to help release that burden. So start with the question of, you know, mom, dad, why do you feel guilty about letting this stuff go? And, and try to work it out from there. And with Ryan's analogy on the record collection, you, you know, yeah, I may want to try to pawn this off on him because I feel like he's going to get value from it. And then I may get my feelings hurt if I realize, oh, he actually isn't. But you know what would hurt my feelings more? If he accepted it but didn't actually want it. Because doing that is disingenuous. That's a great point. And, and I, feel, I feel that just by passing this on to him, I thought he was going to get value from it. He wasn't. And if he were to help me find someone else that will get value from it by either selling it or donating it somewhere uh, responsibly, then I think we're all going to win. That takes a little bit more effort, but that effort for the people we care about is certainly worth it. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't want Josh to take anything of mine out of guilt for sure. Okay, let's move on to our next question. It comes from Rachel. 
She asks, what are your thoughts on keeping sentimental items for the purpose of passing them on to future kids or grandkids? You know, I think, first off, holding on to something just for the sake of holding on to it is wasteful. I, I think that our material possessions, our material things, they've traveled a long way to get where they are right now. And if that is just your attic or your basement or your closet, then, then you know someone initially gave it to you or made it for you or, or manufactured it for a reason. This thing was supposed to serve a purpose at some point in time. And the manufacturers or the gift giver or, or the person who had the sentimental item, you know, the, the, the thing is, is no longer doing what the thing was supposed to do if it's just being held on to, sort of selfishly clinging, as I was getting ready to do with all of my, my mother's stuff. And so I, I would encourage you to, yes, hold on to some sentimental things that you think you can pass on that other people may get value from. But be very, very selective about that. And also be willing to let those go. Those things that you're holding on to, treat them as if they are no longer yours. And if the other person isn't going to get value from it, be willing to, to let that go. And instead of sharing sentimental items with future generations, I would encourage you to create sentimental experiences for them. And, and the things I remember about my mother and spending time with her as a kid or even when she was, she was dying, I remember the experiences, none of the things that, that she passed on to me. Yeah, I would, I would just say, yeah, don't push sentimental items on, on anyone else. I mean, that would be, uh, that's just kind of a recipe for getting your feelings hurt. If you're holding on to, a, let's say, a pocket watch or something, you're like, oh, I'm going to give this to um, my daughter in 20 years, and then you give it to them, and they're, you know, they just kind of look at it like, oh, great, a pocket watch. And it doesn't mean as much to them. Uh, I mean, you're totally setting yourself up to, to, uh, to kind of get your feelings hurt. So yeah, I, I would say uh, if, you have, if you have items that you think are going to add value or, or bring a family member joy uh, down the road and, and you want to pass this sentiment on, um, great. Uh, but don't push that item on the other person and be willing to let that item go. Yeah, sentimental items are heavy. They are anchors. They weigh us down. And and if you don't want to weigh other people down because you care about them, then be really careful about what you're holding on to for them in the future. All right, let's move on to Ed's question. Ed writes, how do you have a conversation about your items that someone else is sentimental about, but those items offer you no value or enjoyment? And only you get to live your life. These other people aren't living your, your life for you. And I would just tell you that there is joy on the other side of letting go. And you should never feel guilty about feeling that joy that you experience from letting go. Yeah, I don't know who's telling you to hold on to your stuff. Um, if it's an item that someone else feels really sentimental about, and you're holding on to it specifically for them, just give it to them. If you don't, if you don't have any uh, joy from that item, if it's not serving a purpose and you are literally holding on to it only because someone else is asking you to hold on to it, um, then I would give it to that person. Okay, let's move on to Amanda's question. Amanda writes, I have a lot of journals that I've poured my heart into. I can't bring myself to throw them away. I don't ever read them but I can't bring myself to get rid of them. What are your thoughts? Well, the first thing I, I would do is consider having a scanning party. We always talk about this for our photographs, but one of the things that, that I did was scan a lot of pages that I felt like they were, they were meaningful to me. And much like Amanda, no, I don't go back and, and really reference them, but I know they're there. I, I don't have any space that's taken up with them. They're all sort of stored in the cloud and, and or, organized that way so that I don't have to deal with it. It is it is safely secure if I ever want it, but but I, I don't have to have the material journals to, to move along with me. And, and you know, I'm, I'm a writer. I, I'm looking at a journal right now that I'm, that I'm writing, and I'm holding it up. In fact, all of these, these questions here, and one day I will get rid of this. I'll scan the stuff that I need to scan. But I'm also reminded of Ernest Hemingway, 
um, you know, his his wife lost a lot of his notebooks. Uh, they're actually stolen uh, from her. And, and that allowed him to move on and create something new. If we're always holding on to our past creations, sometimes that those end up being a roadblock to delving into something more meaningful, something uh, different, some, uh, creating a new work that you'll be even more proud of in the future. Yeah, I would encourage you, too, to go back and read some of your journal entries. See how they make you feel. Because what, you, what you're thinking about is, well, all my life is in these journals and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let go of me. But at the end of the day, are you really going to get value out of those writings? You never read them. Uh, well, go back and read them and see how it makes you feel. And if you read them and you get elated and you're like, oh, man, I just remember this time, then great. Have a scanning party and, and scan some of those pages. But if you read them, like I know for me, when I go back and read college notes or journal entries or uh, the letters that I was talking about early, earlier from high school, they don't give me the same feeling uh, that they did at the time. And really, it's kind of a relief for me because it kind of helps me move on. It helps me to realize that I'm in a different place in my life and that it's, it's time for me to, to make some new experiences. But uh, in addition to Hemingway, I know Jim Morrison from The Doors. Um, he talks about how he experienced the most growth when he threw away his journals. So right before they blew up, uh, he had all these journals with writings and songs and all of this stuff in there, and it was weighing him down. And he made the decision to just, to just get rid of it all, and he experienced uh, the, most, the most growth. I mean, we all know who the doors are. So there's a couple examples for you. Um, hope that helps you out, Amanda. Thanks for the question. Okay, let's move on to Melanie. Melanie writes, how do you sort your photos digitally so they are easy to find later? I have thousands, and it's taking forever. Yeah, if you have thousands of photos, it certainly will take a, a long time. Let's find a way to make it more fun first off. So I just talked about the scanning party. Let me expand on that a little bit. You can find the, the scanner I use, also the digital picture frame uh, that I use over at theminimalists.com slash scanning. And with the scanning party, it's pretty simple. You invite some friends over. You grab all these photographs you have uh, um, either already scanned or you're getting ready to scan and you go go through them with your friends and it allows you to uh, recollect these memories and, and share that experience with other people instead of just doing this by yourself. So you invite some friends, family, whomever over and you're actually able to scan the things in that you want to hold on to and you'll find there are so many photos you don't want to hold on to at all. So you can you can just uh, shred those. You can delete them if they're already stored on, on a hard drive. Now, in terms of, of your question, Melanie, as far as sorting them, I can tell you what I do, and I don't know whether or not this will work for you, but I name each file after the people who are in the uh, the photo itself. So if it's uh, me and Ryan and Sean, Sean's here with us right now recording the podcast for us, I, I would just name it Ryan, Sean, and me, or uh, actually quite often I use last names. So I'll say Nicodemus, Harding, and and myself. And and then I will put a year there if I know the year. And, and that's it. It's not, not the most eloquent way to do it, but it allows me to search for photos of different people. So if I have one with my mother in it, I'll just type in mom that's in the photo folder, and I'll be able to find that. If I want to find mom in the year, it's all cataloged that way as well. So just name the JPEG after the people who are in the photo, and maybe even you want to add a, a location or you want to add the year. I would add that right into the, the title of the JPEG. But I would definitely, definitely encourage you to have a scanning party. Get a digital scanner and, um, and get some digital picture frames and actually use those photos that you have not been using for so long. Great. Um, let's move on to Sarah's comment or question, I should say. I don't own that much stuff, but I love Christmas and I have way too many decorations. What are your thoughts on holiday decor? Sarah, I think you have way too many decorations. Do you know why? Because you said you have way too many decorations. Now, if you would have said, 
I have just enough decorations, I would tell you that you probably have just enough decorations. And you know what? That's a moving target as well. Uh, I, I, for the longest time, had no Christmas decorations at all. But now that I'm with, with uh, Becca and, and Ella, like we put up some Christmas decorations, and that's awesome. And will that change over time? Yeah, we may acquire more. We may let go of others. And, and what, what I do is I enjoy access to, to decorations. What does that mean? Well, that means that, well, I have some for our Christmas tree, and those are certainly just for win items. We talked about that on the previous podcast on, I think it was episode number nine, having just for win items, which is different from just in case. So you can go back and listen to that if you like. But basically, I know that there are some things I'm going to use only once a year. Christmas decorations are a great example. I try to keep those uh, to having as few as possible. And then I enjoy access to other Christmas decorations as well. Generally, if you live in a town that has some sort of public square or public lighting or uh, a, you know, a festival of lights, you, you have the opportunity to still experience those decorations, really elaborate displays. Also, uh, I love driving around looking at, at some of the crazy you know, yard work and the Santas, like making out with Santa Claus or something on someone's front yard with a billion lights in their yard. You can enjoy access to those things without actually having to hold on to a infinite number of holiday decorations. Mariah and I have no Christmas decorations right now. That's what we did last season. We just kind of went around and and admired other people's decorations. But I will say in the midst of doing that, Mariah's like, man, maybe we should get some, some uh, holiday decorations next year. And I'm totally open to that. Um, And we'll talk about that next year. Um, But certainly we're not going to go crazy with it. We'll be very, very uh, uh, deliberate with it. Maybe we'll put up a tree, string some lights around it, maybe string some lights around the house if if that's what we want to do. Um, but yeah, we certainly uh, wouldn't just go out and start buying all of the on-sale Christmas item decorations just for the sake of having them. The last thing I would add, this is really for all of our, our questions here, is here's another question to ask yourself when you're thinking about letting go of sentimental items. And it's sort of a double question. That question is, what's the worst thing that could happen? And Ryan and I wrote an essay about this. It is in our book, Essential. So I'm going to send everyone who asked us a question today a, a copy of, an autograph copy of Essential, which we talk a lot about letting go, especially in the first two chapters of that book. But here is an excerpt from that essay. This is the worst thing that could happen. Risk scares the crap out of people. Many of us associate risk with failure, failure with pain. Yet we're told that we must take plenty of risks to succeed. Thus, success must be painful, right? Not necessarily. When it comes to challenging our preconceived notions about risk, the common platitudinal question tossed around by kind-hearted friends and self-help gurus is, what's the worst thing that could happen? Truth be told, some risks are fairly benign. Letting go of most of your material possessions... Asking a cute guy or girl for his or her phone number. Writing the first page of the book you've always wanted to write. What's the worst thing that could happen? Likely, nothing at all. There is no real risk in these harmless endeavors. Other risks, however, probably should scare the shit out of you. Skydiving, purchasing a home, quitting your job. What's the worst thing that could happen? Some pretty awful shit, actually. Death. Debt and poverty, respectively. That doesn't mean you shouldn't take these risks. It means you should approach each risk with logic, reason, and intuition. Peer over the edge before taking your proverbial leap. And if it makes sense, then leap. Because not leaping can be a much bigger risk. The difference then between the benign risks and the real risks is that the latter possesses potentially life-altering worst-case consequences, while the former virtually no threat at all. When you think about it, though, the benign risk can also hold life-altering consequences if you change the question. What is the best, not the worst, but the best thing that could happen? Perhaps getting rid of your excess stuff will free up time, money, space, and give you the much-needed peace of mind that you've been waiting for. Perhaps that phone number will lead to a fulfilling relationship. Perhaps writing that first page will lead to a second, and then a third, 
and so on until you're staring at a bestseller. Any of these outcomes would likely change your life for the better. Similarly, the real risks can have tremendous upsides. Jumping from a plane could be the most exhilarating experience of your life. The first time you've felt truly alive, a new home might be ideal for your family, a place in which you enjoy meaningful experiences. Walking away from your career could be the catalyst toward starting your own business or a life of growth and contribution. It was both for us. That doesn't mean you should undertake any of these risks either. It just means we must ask these two questions more frequently. After all, what's the worst or the best thing that would happen if we did? So ask yourself that question. What's the worst thing that could happen by letting go? And then conversely, what's the best thing that could happen by letting go? Okay, it's time for our added value portion of the show. This is where we each recommend something that has added value to our lives recently. And since we're talking about letting go and and trying to feel lighter and freer and and happier from that letting go process, I'm going to recommend a particular uh, podcast episode. Uh, Our friend Rob Bell has a, a podcast called The Robcast. And episode 22 of that podcast, which is about a year old now, it's called Light heavy light. And he talks a lot about many of the things that we talked about here, about being willing to let go, about moving on to a new time in your life without some of the things, be that material possessions or relationships or careers or things that were in the way before, moving through a period of light to a period of of where things are heavy and then going to another period where it's light again. The lightness is beneath this weight of of clutter that we've been holding on to. So we'll put a a link to that as well as all of the things we've mentioned in today's show in uh, the show notes over at theminimalists.com slash podcast. But I encourage you to take a listen to that. It is not on iTunes right now. It's an older episode. And so you'll you'll have to find it there on his website at robbell.com. Yes, I would... Well, I'll preface this before I make my recommendation. This past weekend... Uh, Big Sky Film Festival here in Missoula, in Missoula, Big Sky Documentary Film Festival. It's all documentaries. Um, uh, in fact, our uh, movie um, w- was there on opening night, Friday night. It went, it went amazing. But I've watched probably uh, six or seven movies over the weekend, and I have been on like this crazy emotional roller coaster with these movies. And it has really helped change my perspective in a lot of ways. And I think, you know, for someone who is trying to get rid of sentimental things, um, a new perspective could certainly help. So go and attend a film festival that is near your area. Uh, It doesn't have to be a documentary film festival. That's what seems to uh, make me the most emotional is when I hear these like real life stories and, and, and see what people go through. Um, but any film festival will do because there are some really great quality movies there. Uh, definitely do some research on what movies you're going to see. Um, I didn't just show up randomly at different movies. I uh, was actually surprised that I wanted to see so many of them this weekend, but they just had great uh, synopsis and sounded like it would be something that help, would help change my perspective on different things, and it certainly has. So if you want a rich experience, if you want a different, uh, different perspective, um, that's one way to do it. Let's move on to our next segment, what we call... Right here, right now. This is where we finally get to talk about ourselves for once. Uh, Let's see, we have a few things going on right now. Every Tuesday in February at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, we're doing a hashtag Ask the Minimalists round, lightning round, live on video on Periscope and on Twitter. You can find all the details about that at theminimalists.com slash Tuesdays, but we're having a ton of fun doing that. So join us while you can. Uh, I already mentioned our tour, but we really are looking forward to seeing you there if you're there in one of those cities. If not, we really hope you grab tickets to this documentary. Cannot wait to share this documentary with you. Right now we have all the United States uh, information up there at minimalismfilm.com. Details coming this summer on Canada, Australia, and hopefully some other overseas uh, distribution. 
And then uh, I'm teaching a writing workshop in June, so it's a little ways off, but you can go ahead and register for that right now at howtowritebetter.org. I taught one last month, and it was awesome. I really, really enjoyed teaching it, and so many people got value from it, I decided to do it again. So you can find all the details to that, as well as my my longer writing course at howtowritebetter.org. And I'm going to be spending some time in Florida next month, in, in March, um, and uh, part of that is at our new coffee shop, Bandit Coffee Co., down in St. Petersburg. And I'll be attending the minimalist.org meetup while I'm down there. So hopefully if you're in the area, that one is on uh, March 9th. And so I'll be there March 9th through the 17th. I don't have any other events going on, but I'll spend a lot of time at Bandit. So you can find me there sitting at a, a table or maybe I'll, I'll hop behind the counter and make a pour over for you if you're around. So stop on through. If you get a chance, you can find all the details to that as well as all of our other meetup groups. We have 100 of them in eight different countries at minimalist.org. And if we don't have one close to you, we have an online city where you can meet with open-minded, like-minded people who are going to be supportive on your journey of decluttering or or minimalism or or whatever it may be. And the last thing I will say is another month is right around the corner. What a perfect time for the 30-day minimalism game. You can uh, uh, find all the details about that at theminimalists.com slash game. It's completely free, and at the end of it, it'll be completely clutter-free once you've gotten rid of a bunch of excess stuff. It's a great way to challenge yourself and also some of uh, the people around you. All right, let's listen to some voicemail comments from our listeners from the last episode. My name is Elizabeth, and I am from Houston, Texas. I was calling to leave a comment about post-clutter, how clutter clearing has just been such a value added to my life. And um, I tease that the more clutter I clear, the more clutter I find to clear. Hey guys, my name is Jackie Drassey. I just wanted to suggest something out to your readers, something that really helped me uh, become a minimalist and survive as a minimalist is really changing my mindset. The power of not having things really comes from not wanting them. So once I decided to not want things, then it didn't matter that I couldn't have them. So now when I see, say, the latest trendy handbag or latest trendy fashion, I'm like, I don't want that, which gives me the power of the choice instead of saying I can't have that because of debt restrictions or clutter restrictions. And that has miraculously kept me a minimalist for several years now. Hey, Justin Ryan. Um, my name is Rachel. I'm from Portland, Oregon. I, mean, I guess when you're dealing with physical objects in your life, your interaction is sort of at the level of the physical world. Like you're using your senses to interpret and, I guess, interact with the world around you. You can see with those senses senses or perceive with those senses and what I found upon sort of I guess controlling that part of my life to the point where I wasn't thinking about it anymore (laughs) was that yeah it's like you feel called toward a passion but a lot of times people say well find your passion and that's so vague and so the way that I sort of came to understand that after a lot of trial and error and a lot of sort of pondering this is that Actually, what lied sort of as the next step beyond the physical was, like, my feelings. (laughs) And it sounds kind of goofy, but what I realized was that my feelings weren't just there to drive me crazy (laughs) and drive those around me crazy. My feelings are actually sort of this amazing internal guidance system toward or away from my passion. So I sort of started really tuning in to those feelings. And actually, it was like, if it felt good, if it felt like it warmed up my chest, if it kind of gave me like a positive excitement, I was like, maybe I should look into that thing more. So just sort of listening to that internal guidance system and not judging where it took me um, was really instrumental in finding my passion. All right, y'all, that's it for this episode. If you have questions for The Minimalist, give us a call, 406-219-7839. And if you leave here with just one message, 
We hope it's this. Love people and use things, because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it Every little thing that you gotta have Every little thing that you gotta have You gotta reach for and you gotta grab Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it So take your eyes away Or take